Dave Winham. Good thank, to see you. First and foremost, thank you for doing this. Thank you, man. I I, it's I, an honor to be here with you for the first one. Yeah, that's right. And we actually had some competition on that because I talked to another individual and who we know, Chad, mm -hmm. and he's like, man, I want to do it. I just got so much going on every Saturday morning. I'm just so busy, but I want to do it. And I was like, yeah, man, like we could do this Saturday. We could do next Saturday. He's like, yeah, what I really want to do is I want to be the first. And I'm like, uh, all right, well, sorry, Chad, that's on you. Like, you know, you tell me when you're available, man, I'll work around your schedule. Well, you know, not everybody can be first. That's right. <laughs> Uh, well, the first thing that I want to say is uh, a little bit about this podcast for anybody who's listening. So this is Downloading Dollars. As you can see, you know, Mix Solutions is our company. I was a partner and I still am a partner at Mix Solutions. And we'd been thinking about doing this podcast for quite a long time. Sort of stemmed from an idea that I heard from someone that they said, the internet has massively broadened the horizon of possible careers. Most people haven't figured this out yet. And I thought about that and I understood how true that is, that as I kind of talked to you before off air, it doesn't really matter where you're located any longer no. geographically in the world as to how much you have the potential to earn. It also doesn't necessarily matter how much access to education you have. Certainly higher education has its place, but the internet has allowed you to essentially learn anything that you are interested in learning from probably a very qualified individual and take that skill set out into the public marketplace. And I don't think enough people have really recognized that yet. I mean, certainly the internet, it's everywhere and it's everything for us. But, you know, when you were probably, you know, coming up through some of the sports entertainment world, you couldn't just get on Google and feel like, you know, how to oh, get into the sports business. Certainly not. And, you know, in our industry, it used to be that people would say, well, you know, as, as long as I'm near an airport, huh. you know, that, you know, I can you do can whatever get, I need, need to do. To I can do whatever I need to do. And that's kind of moot right now. And then to your point about education, and certainly, as you say, you know, both of us uh, have, uh, you know, collegiate athletics in our background. And, and uh, I, I was a coach at the college level for a number of years before uh, going into business. But um the investment in education now is unlike any investment you would ever make if you think about it. You know, if you think about maybe your kids and and uh, it's going to cost X amount to put them through Ohio State University. And then you look at, you know, what that is going to what that investment is actually going to reap. You would not make any other investment in the way you make investments in college education these days. And it's a, it's a, uh, it's a terrain that has really changed a lot in the last 10 years. Yeah. You talk about investments. I, the first thing that I think of when someone tells me that whether they're going to college or they're interested in taking on, you know, some sort of debt to obtain higher education. I think about those real estate seminars that we've all probably been to one or two times that we're going to teach you how to get rich. And you can insert any really career here, teach you how to get rich in real estate, in selling right. of e-commerce products or Amazon right. FBA. Rock and roll. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever it is. I don't think I got invited to learn, those. Learn how to play guitar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then they get to the punchline and it's, hey, you need to pay us $30,000. And everyone yeah. goes, oh, come on, man. Yeah. Right. But we don't really bat an eye at that education process. You go 30000 okay, that's your first year. Yeah. And then you stack on two, three, and four. Oh, and you need a higher education, which I'm and not hopefully somewhere along the way, you're going to figure out what it is uh, that you want to study that is hopefully by the time you're 25, something that you really are interested in pursuing and hopefully you're keeping up with the changes in you know in the world during that time yeah and you pick a major when you're in the first year or second year who knows by year three or four or when you go on and get your master's in year five and six that that's even applicable um so right. i think what i'm trying to accomplish with this podcast is twofold one make people aware at the opportunity that they have to utilize the internet to not just earn an income, right? Because we all want to earn an income, but really what I think people are searching for is freedom from the game, essentially. You know, that same entrepreneur who said that about the internet, uh, Naval Ravikant, he said, the point of the game is to leave it. 
So essentially, you want to earn enough income that you can choose how you play the game, right. not be forced to play the game and continue running on the treadmill so that you'll never get out ahead of it and be able to take that time that you have earned and utilize it. So I want to show people that there are not just numerous opportunities, there are tens of thousands of opportunities. Oh. And, and really what that statement really, really means is start with the end in mind. And because the world is changing so quickly, that's more and more challenging to do, but it's every bit as important as it ever was. Mm -hmm. And the second thing, I want to show people the people side of it, because we all have a very different, unique experience of navigating through this business world. So if I can give people some examples of individuals such as yourself, which I want to hear the whole story from start to finish because I've heard bits and pieces of it and I know there's some fascinating uh, aspects to it. But show people that it's available to them and show people the people that have done it because I'm the type of person where you tell me something could be done, like go show me the proof, right? Well, this person did it and I go, all right, well, I think I'm smart. I think I'm competent. I think I'm hardworking. I don't necessarily know if this person is more of those things than I am, but maybe not. So maybe I could go out and I could do that. And I think that now that people don't necessarily need to be fixed to one physical loc location, they can take it upon themselves to use the internet. And like I told you, you know, if I follow a guy on Twitter who lives in rural Guatemala mm -hmm. and he teaches people how to utilize Twitter to grow a following. So that guy's earning American dollars in Guatemala where... I have no doubts our currency is quite powerful, right. but no doubt that his cost of living is significantly lower. So that guy's probably living like a king. Why? Not because he lives in downtown New York and he's next to the biggest stockbroker firms, but because he has harnessed this power of the internet that I think we all have access to. But most people are just like, well, where are the jobs? They're near me. And the other thing about that is creating your own opportunities. Right. Because now that the internet has kind of unraveled the opening for anyone to create their own opportunities and lanes, you don't need to be fixed to finding that company that will give you that opportunity. You know, there's millions of different side hustles that I mm -hmm. want to showcase on this podcast. And, you know, you think about it, the combination of technology and the fact that we're, you know, coming out of the, you know, the COVID era. Um, yeah, <laughs> is such that, you know, some of the, you know, capitals of commerce, New York City, right? you know, uh, somebody just asked me uh, in a meeting uh, associated with uh, sponsor partnerships for um, some professional sports leagues that we're developing, said something to me like, well, why don't you put an office in Dallas and New York and just go to work? Which I replied, well, we already have an office in Dallas, uh, but it that doesn't really matter so much anymore. Um, <clears throat> sponsorship has always been about relationships, and it's l less about geography than it's ever been. Yeah, so Dave, um, why don't you give people a little bit of a word on what you do? And I'll put a caveat in that by saying, everyone that I know that played a college sport I don't want to say everyone, but let's say a significant portion of the people that played a college sport, they want to go into the sports business, right? Many I do, want, yes. I want yeah. to be a coach or a trainer, absolutely a player, but most of the time people aren't allowed to do that. Uh, they want to be an agent. They want to be, you know, a marketer, a media person. I'll sell tickets, man. I want to be on the game day staff. Sure. Those folks, they have lots of lots of desire to get to that. I think there's only so many positions within that world. But just give us a little bit of backdrop on your uh, persona and perspective in the sports and entertainment sure. world. Yeah, I grew up in Detroit, um, and uh, I was I really was influenced by um, not only coaches that I had in my life, like my high school football coaches, and uh, but also you know I grew up in a Michigan family. Uh, my dad went to Michigan Law School, and. Uh, hell, he probably carried me to my first Michigan game, uh. you know, that I attended. And, and I really look, I, you know, it sounds funny, but I really, my heroes when it came to football were Bo Schembechler and Woody Hayes, you know, mm. when I was a little kid and uh, uh, even more so than the players themselves. And 
I went to college to become a college football coach. That's what I wanted to do and be and make and uh, was was able to uh, do that, uh, not because of my um, playing skills, oh, by the way. My uh, skills were such that with one year of eligibility remaining, uh, my head coach Jim, at Grand Valley State, Jim Harkema, called me into his office and uh, indi- after spring football and indicated to me that uh, – he thought a change of position. I was a fullback. He thought a change of position would be good for me, and I said, "Really, coach defense?" And he said, "No, I think coaching would be good for uh, you." And so that's how uh, that's how that started. But that's what I was there to do. And um, you know, I think you're right. You know, I can't tell you how many people I've talked to over the years that start talking about their visions for their future by saying, "I love sports." Right. Well, that's cool. You know, I do too. Um, but again, like we just alluded to a moment ago, you got to start with the end in mind and set your goals high. I think, because even if you don't, you know, arrive at that spot that you think you wanted to arrive, you know, when you were 20, uh, it's probably going to take you to a pretty good place. So you get to Grand Valley, you play there for a period of time. Coach asks you, help me with the staff kind of take me through what what happens next i know a lot of these guys you know i played uh soccer at ashland university right of course but my roommates were football guys so Mm -hmm. i know a lot of these guys and that grind that they go through and how many coaches and staff and members are all kind of trying to vie for that you know they all want to coach ohio state eventually uh so take me through kind of what happens next in your your career so uh my uh College coach gave me my first opportunity, and was I heartbroken for for a day or two there? Yeah, I was because you know I had um, big ideas, and uh, you know I continue to have them to this very day. Uh. But um, he really did me one hell of a favor because I graduated from college with um, two years of college coaching experience, and it really gave me a hell of an advantage. I actually uh, left home as a uh, teenager, and uh, sounds like the beginning of a B movie. I was a teenage runaway, but, uh, but I really was. And, and, uh, so, um, I had gotten my first couple of years of education at the junior college level in Dallas, Texas, and then transferred into Grand Valley state. So I only had a limited amount of eligibility and, uh, but in any event, um, that opportunity gave me such an advantage over, most people that were graduating from college. So I got an opportunity to coach a couple of years at the high school level. And then I was a graduate assistant at University of Cincinnati many years before they were the mighty, mighty Bearcats oh, that right. they are today. Uh, I'm so proud of, of what they've achieved there over the last several years. But um, And then I returned to Grand Valley State, um, you know, kind of as a full-fledged assistant. And it went from there. I was doing exactly what I set out to do. Um, One of my good friends, my closest friend in my coaching life, is a gentleman by the name of Mike Denbrock, who just left the Bearcats to become the offensive coordinator at uh, LSU with Brian Kelly. And the three of us coached together at that time at Grand Valley State. And uh, I found out during that time that there was something called arena football, and it was just a brand new thing. The USFL had just kind of closed its door. I don't know if you ever heard about this, but they they won their lawsuit against, uh, like a monopoly lawsuit against the NFL, and they won it and were awarded $3. I think I've got it right. Treble damages. Uh, They were awarded $1, but it was automatically tripled. And uh, that ultimately shut that league down, and arena football uh, came to be right on its heels. And what I could see from... uh, from uh, just reading this business card size article in the Detroit Free Press was that Mike and Marion Illich, the founders of Little Caesars Pizza and Hmm. owners of the Detroit Red Wings and a little while later the the Detroit Tigers, were going to bring something called Arena Football to Joe Louis Arena. Well, as a kid, I had worked for Little Caesars Pizza when there was like 10 of them. Hmm. You You talk about a great American success story, Mike and Marion Illich, uh, you know, started out with him selling pots and pans door to door and, you know, built a, you know, multinational, multi billion dollar corporation. But I remembered enough about Mr. Illich to know that if he was bringing something 
that he was going to refer to as pro football to Joe Lewis Arena, where he was the new owner of the Red Wings, it was worth a young coach checking into. And I've often explained it this way that um, the laws have changed. Now they would call it stalking, but I, I mounted a campaign for uh. about eight months to land a, a you know an entry level coaching position in that league, and it changed my career forever. And I understand at one point in time, you were coach and president of a arena football team. Yeah, I was a head coach and vice president of business operations. For was, that, the, was that significantly later in your career? I would say, well, let's do them. I can always mark time by where I was coaching. Yeah. You know, but in that first half of my so-called adult life, I uh, um, started coaching in 1980, and it was 1988 when I uh, got that first job in uh, – with the Detroit Drive, the you know Illich family owned Arena Football team in a brand new league. I mean, nobody had ever heard of Arena Football. It was brand new, and uh, you know what I you know I knew I had successfully mounted a campaign, and I'm telling you, it was eight months where um, where I made sure that for eight months that there was uh, not going to be a week that they didn't hear from or about me, both at the Detroit Red Wings office and at the league office. And again, you know, they, you know, restraining orders might be issued at this, you know, <laughs> in this day and age, but I think they appreciated my enthusiasm and, um, you know, I got an opportunity, but what I didn't realize about that opportunity, Alex, was that it wasn't just a great coaching job opportunity for a young division two college assistant coach. What it was, what it turned out to be, was the best graduate education I could have ever gotten in the business of sports and entertainment. Yeah, and that I think is, I was just thinking as you were speaking there, kind of this sounds like where the paths diverge mm -hmm. between you and some of your peers, yeah. where some of your peers continue in the college ranks, and now we see, you know, sometime later, they are, you know, coaches of... Mm -hmm. Big teams, you know, defensive coordinators, offensive coordinators, head coaches. And yeah, hell, when I was a graduate assistant at Cincinnati, we had a player. You may, may have heard of him. His name was Urban Meyer. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it, it, he uh, had a pretty good run in, at the college level. And, and I could go on and on and on with guys that, you know, started right alongside us that, you know, have, have really, really done well. And is that business the – the football business, is that kind of just a grind where you have to be there for 20, 30, 40 years? Or is it something where, you know, you can maybe skip some steps, you know, work your way in? Because in the business world, you there are those zero to 100 stories. You know, if you hit it right and you figure out the market and things like that. But it just doesn't seem like that's really even possible in the football world. Well, maybe a little more possible than it used to be. I okay. mean, certainly... Uh, the NFL and major colleges uh, uh, have been hiring younger head coaches than was typical mm -hmm. over the last, you know, you know, many many years. But um, it, it certainly is um, a profession in which you have to be willing to grind, and you have to understand this. Bo Schembechler was the one that uh, said this in his book: is like if you're getting involved uh, with college football coaching because you want to you're seeking fame and fortune think about something else to do because there's not enough of either of those things in that profession for you uh, certainly the top one or two percent of the profession enjoys uh, some of those things but by and large it's um, you know there are thousands and thousands and thousands of coaches that are great coaches that um you know, that uh, do their thing at the high school level, at the Division two and three levels. And I'm talking about great coaches that are not only know their football or know their basketball or whatever the case may be, but are <laughs> dramatically and dynamically influencing lives in ways that very few of us have an opportunity to even think about. Yeah, and soccer, they... It it's not a coach, it's a manager. Manager. You yeah. have a manager. Right. Because they're not necessarily the coach. They're not out there on the field. Some of them are, certainly. 
but they are managing the team, mm-hmm. uh, which is kind of an interesting thing because I think about that as the same thing in football, you know, because the rosters are so much larger. The staffs are, so, you just talked about yesterday with me, the kit guy or the uh, the equipment manager. Yeah. And I went, oh, I didn't even think about that, you know, because in most sports, you know, basketball, you don't really need an equipment man. You got a couple <laughs> of basketballs, you got yeah. shoes, jerseys, that's that. Somebody's got to do the laundry. Anytime the football team travels somewhere, you need an extra bus just for the pads. Oh, well, I'll tell you right now, yeah, I don't care what, you know, Division One college football program you talk about, but the Buckeyes, for example, when they travel wherever, Wisconsin, you know, there's a semi or two mm. with the equipment crew. I mean, I, I would assure you that right now in, you know, at the Woody, that there's 20 equipment guys. And some of them, I'm sure, are students and interns. But there's 20 guys in the in the equipment department for Ohio State football. I'm sure of it. Mm. So you do take this divergent path. You go into arena football, mm-hmm. which is a... We know what arena football is now, you yeah. know, having the hindsight, um, you know, kind of a thing that, uh, tell me, at that point in time, did you have any thoughts, oh, this could be, you know, it's not going to replace the NFL, but this could be, you know, the next big thing in the United States. Here's the reason why I was so excited, because so many of the players, coaches, and executives from the USFL that accomplished some pretty good things uh, in the previous four or five years were moving into arena football. And uh, I just viewed it as a um, kind of a special thing for a young coach to get involved in and a way to kind of, you know, break myself from the herd a little bit from, you know, the thousands of guys that were in the same position I was as an assistant coach at a small college program. I was not wrong about that. But what I had no idea about, as I alluded to a moment ago, was – what I was really signing up for. And maybe they didn't even know, uh, you know, at Olympia Arenas Incorporated, that I was signing up for an education, a graduate education in the business of sports and entertainment. And like I say, it changed my career. Yeah, I think you hit on something there really important, specifically for the business world, but really any application. That ability to do something a little bit different than everyone else you know, I know we, we see, I talk about this all the time in the e-commerce space. You know, if you're looking at a clock and you want to think about a new product, you know, top being midnight, below being six, you don't want to go from midnight to six with your product that is 180 degree different. You know, we have this cup. I'm going to reinvent the cup. I'm going to give you something that you've never experienced before. I tell people like, that's a great idea. There's probably a reason why that doesn't exist. You know, I've got a washing machine that also can cook your food. That's a great idea. Probably a reason it doesn't exist. Either A, it is not interesting to our people, or B, it is not something that's physically possible to manufacture. C, it's cost prohibitive. And oftentimes, you know, a good thought is a bad idea. Yeah. You know, and, and, but there's nothing wrong with, uh, with uh, getting out there waist deep and finding out, hey, maybe that was a bad idea and walk yourself back in and, you know, work on the next one. And God knows every, uh, uh, whether you're talking about coaching, whether you're talking about uh, any business endeavor, you know, you've got to be willing to to uh, take some unreasonable chances from time to time. Mm-hmm. And, you know, on my clock, if I'm looking at it, I tell folks, go to one o'clock, go to two o'clock, <laughs> maybe three o'clock, you yeah. know, tweak it a little bit, make yeah. the product a little bit different. Just like you just said, you know, you weren't trying to reinvent football. No, you were trying to take yourself and make it so that, Hey, I I've been a high level coach and yes, maybe a smaller thing, you know, mm-hmm. arena football than D one college football. But I also have these ancillary skills that I was able to develop, which has now pushed you to where you are Mm -hmm. in the sports and entertainment and media side of things. Right. And where you eventually, as I alluded to, were coach and kind of running the business side. Absolutely running the business side. Which is one of the craziest things that I have ever heard and I want to hear more about. Well, um, it's a it's a study in what not to do. But, you know, uh, there's a credo, you know, with. uh, with the college football coaches of my era, especially when we were, uh, you know, young assistants and graduate assistants, you know, some uh, seasoned 
coordinator or assistant would tell you this line that, hey, the more things you can do. And what that abbreviated statement meant was the more things you can do, the better chance you have of sticking around. And then it, it kind of became a natural thing that you wanted to take on as much as you could to, you know, give you a chance at growth in the profession. But um, I would never recommend that one should uh, uh, attempt to run the business of a professional team and coach it as well. You know, but uh, it was, uh, you know, it was one of the great experiences that I've had. And we were uh, we were able to really do some good things and I was able to learn a lot. And I think a lot of the people that were with us learned a lot. But also, you know, one of the measurements, I think, for are, am I doing this the right way or am I not doing this the right way is is the you know, when you look back at it 20 years later and you look at your core group and some of them are still with you. And then the others are general managers at the NFL level, uh, general counsel for the NHL, um, athletic director at an SEC, you know, university. And you, you got to feel good about that. So you're in arena football. You know, I, I know you've coached multiple teams at the arena football level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, talk to me how the transition from I'm going to be a football coach because I know that seems to be a profession where you're, as you would call it, a headball coach. Yeah. You're a headball coach. You continue to do that. That's that's your thing. Yeah. When does that process happen where you go, hey, I think I can do something else, and maybe even I'm better at something else? Yeah. Well, certainly uh, football coaching, I'm sure coaches in pretty much every other sport uh, would be the same. But it tends to attract very determined people mm -hmm. who absolutely positively believe they know what they want and what they want to do. And um, what happened with me in arena football was um, as a head coach of an expansion team that uh, was also uh, vice president of business operations for that same team and literally running the business. There was no one in our uh, organization that I didn't place, that we didn't train. And, uh, and we built a, uh, a business that was um, record setting, you know, that, that uh, did things that nobody in arena football had ever done to that point. And uh, I just started to realize that I was good at that. And, you know, um, there, <laughs> there's a whole lot more football coaches than there are good coaching jobs but I will tell you this, especially when you talk about niche level pro leagues like arena football, there is a real vacuum when it comes to real management expertise. And, you know, I'd learned from some of the best. We had uh, Gary Vito at uh, Joe Lewis Arena, who was really Mr. Illich's right hand man. And uh, he, along with my dear friend Craig Bender, really mentored me. And, and I, and, and I got to say, both. Both Craig Bender and Gary, the late, great Gary Vito that we miss so much, they saw that in me long before I saw it. But they, uh, they were good leaders. So you transition. You're going to be, you know, more so helping run teams, be a part of teams. Uh, and eventually you decide, hey, like, I don't want to be tied to one team. I'm not going to be the person who just manages a team. You decide... I'm going to open up a business that helps people utilize these skills that yeah, I have. Yeah, and, and let me tell you exactly how that happened. We, uh, after uh, I uh, left the, the Buffalo Destroyers where I served in both of those roles, and I would say that, you know, on the business role, I uh, probably would have received an A-plus, and on the coaching role for that first-year expansion team, I probably would have received a D-minus, you know, Um <laughs> We won one game that year in a very mature league at that point that I, I want to say was, you know, 17, 18 years old, had some great teams, and we had a new team, and we were taking our licks and and got competitive at, at the end of that season. But, um, you know, you, you got to be able to to get it done on all sides of things. And what what ended up taking place with me was I took a position after that, actually turned down a position to operate a league, um, not because I didn't think I was ready for it at that point in my life, but because uh, they uh, didn't want to give me uh, bonuses for, for selling uh, 
expansion teams. And really, it was that mm. moment that ultimately led us to creating our company, The Team. Our, our company is called The Team, not just because I'm an old ball coach. It's an acronym for the experts in acquisition and management for the sports and entertainment industry. And so um, I took that job. We operated a couple of teams. They were brand new teams and markets that the owner was not present in. And we really got a baptism of fire, um, you know, kind of figuring out what it takes to be successful when you're starting from scratch in a new marketplace. And it was South Louisiana, Baton Rouge and Lafayette, Louisiana, which I fell in love with. But, you know, we, we had a, as old coach Markham, my, one of my coach, one of my coaching mentors would say, we had our plow in some hard dirt. Alex. <laughs> and, uh, and, but, but what we learned was, you know, the requisites of success in our industry or really any industry. And, and those include, uh, having a financial model that is viable, where you can be profitable if you do a good job. And then you need three things. You need funding, you need management expertise, and you need time to get the job done. And when you can bring those four elements together in practically any endeavor, you can enjoy great success. And so uh, we decided to take what we learned and, and create our company, which, again, is called The Team, we started out just doing two things. Now we do four, but those two things were to be a reputable place wherein folks that are, were interested in owning and operated, operating uh, sports and entertainment companies could go for buy-sell transactions. We would manage those types of transactions. And then the other service we provided was uh, consulting and management work to give new owners a fighting chance at success and Owners who were wanting to sell, uh, you know, we would do things to help them make their company ready for sale. So, Dave, I know you've interacted with, through this process, a lot of really successful and wealthy people, you know, because that's generally who acquires sports teams, is uh, not your average Joes, people who have had an incredible amount of success through what they've done. And I know you've told me about so many different unique mm -hmm. industries that I kind of scratch my head and go, I didn't even know that was a thing. But can you talk to me about, and you don't have to certainly name drop oh, anyone, but talk to me about what you think it is that you've seen in these individuals that makes them unique. Obviously, once you get to that status of I'm going to acquire a team, you're already, you know, your personality has certainly changed a bit. But what do you think has helped these individuals get to that point? And I know people who are listening, they're like, I, I, look, I don't want to be a billionaire. You know, I just want to, I want to make sure that I can pay my car payments, make my house payments, <laughs> sure. you know, take care of my kids. But, you know, I'm wondering if there's some unique insight to be had there from individuals who have sort of reached the pinnacle. I want to say something that kind of relates to a comment you were making right at the beginning of the show. And, uh, Certainly, I've worked for several uh, multi-billionaires. Rich DeVos, um, one of my early jobs uh, when I got out of uh, graduate school, um, and I was coaching at Grand Valley State and was making nothing like most young coaches, I managed the fitness facilities at the Amway Grand Plaza Hotel in downtown Grand Rapids and ultimately became the fitness director for uh, uh, everything that they had going on on that side of the world of the of life in the in the 80s this is a man um who never went to college mm. or if he did he certainly didn't graduate and um by the time i would really come to know him i had met him once before but by the time i would come to know him he and his partner uh in business a guy by the name of uh, jay van andel were the owners and operators of, and get your head around this one, the world's largest privately held company. Hmm. That's, you know, that's mind boggling. Mm -hmm. But um, then uh, Mike Illich, uh, you know, he did not finish college. He was a college and uh, ultimate, almost, almost a major league baseball player, but uh, did not graduate from college. There was a gentleman uh, that we just lost recently that was a real uh, mentor to me, and he was the uh, guy that put me in a position to both coach and run the business 
of his new team, Mark Hamister, who uh, you know made his considerable uh, fortune primarily in in uh, uh, healthcare, but in some other areas as well. Did not finish college, left college to go to work, and uh, so many of these guys. Um, were not um, bound by rules that you have to do it this way. They had an open mind to and open eyes to always look for when it's time time to move. And I will tell you one other thing that most of the the successful people in life that I have known is they not only have the the and it takes a great amount of confidence to just change directions. Hell, you know, uh, some some of these people, I'm one of them, change careers, you know, and in, in totally in midstream. Well, it takes a certain amount of confidence to do that. Um, and I'm going to share it with a personal experience. My uh, late great uh, Uncle Jack Labby, uh, when I was involved, as you're aware, we now uh, uh, produce uh, officially licensed NCAA feature length documentary films. Mm -hmm. And we do a lot of writing and production assignments. And when I was working on my very first one, it was a book. And he said to me, not meaning to be insulting in any way or disrespectful, but he said to me, Dave, whatever made you think you could write a book? Uh, And my response was not a, you know, it was right. I, I just said it never occurred to me that I couldn't. Exactly. You know, and, and I think that's the thing that a lot of uh, my mentors and the people that I've been fortunate enough to to learn from had that trait where it just never occurred to them that they weren't going to get it done. I think you really hit something on the head there about you were stating that a lot of these individuals didn't get through college or maybe they started, but they left. I mean, that same story is true with, you know, people like Mark Zuckerberg, people like Steve Jobs, they start in this educational process and then they go, hold on a minute, I'm not sure if this is for me. And I think one of the things that they have that most people don't have is, I don't want to call it a bullshit filter, but they go, this doesn't make sense. I get what everyone's told me so far is that you work hard in high school. Why? To go in and get a good college opportunity. Certainly. Why do you work hard in college? To go on and get a good job opportunity. Why do you work hard in your job to go on and get a promotion, Mm -hmm. right? Well, why do I want all those things? So that you can get a wife, get a house, get all the things (laughs) that you want. Right. But if you go back to the beginning of that story and you go, okay, I'm in high school. Well, what do you want to accomplish? I think that's a different story. And if you want to accomplish vast amounts of wealth, I don't necessarily know if that path is the one that gets you there every single time. It might be a safe path, you know, you and I have never met a doctor who's really broke, but, <laughs> but we've met a lot of really wealthy people who aren't doctors, who aren't lawyers, who are individuals who didn't make it through that educational system. Reason being, they went, I don't know if I agree with this system, and this might be your system, but this ain't my system. Right. And I understand that there's a way out here that I can go about earning and creating what I want to create without following the path that you've developed. And I think that really hits on it, is that a lot of these individuals who have gone on to do astounding things, they didn't listen to the people who went, "Eh, I don't know about that. They went, okay, well, I trust what I'm going to do. And that's led a lot of people the wrong way. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to say that those are biased stories because we know about them because they did make it all the way to the top. But... I think those individuals who are free thinkers who go, hey, I I see something that maybe not everyone else is seeing, or maybe you guys are all focusing on a very tight window where I'm focusing on the whole picture. Or a safe path, as you said. Safe path. And, you know, this is something that I really love. It's that individual entrepreneurial opportunities often fail. But throughout the course of a career, entrepreneurs rarely fail. Mm -hmm. That's well stated. Yeah. Yeah. I wish I could take credit for it. Uh, (laughs) But the reason being for that is if you are like, I'm an entrepreneur, that's me, that's who I am. If you go out and you fail, that wasn't necessarily a bad thing. Mm -hmm. That was just an opportunity to pick up on some of the things that did not work for you. And I think that is something that a lot of people utilize their job for. They go, I'm trying to learn more about the world through a job. But I go back 
to my collegiate experience. And one of the things that we did was a lot of fake college business projects. Mm -hmm. So what I would do is I'd go and create a fake coffee shop, run me the fake financials, <laughs> run me the fake, uh, you know, marketing campaigns and all these things. And now that I'm older, I look back and I go, well, why weren't we just actually having the young people start a business? Because it's so much easier to tell someone, well, I'm going to spend 5,000 on marketing and then I'm going to spend, you know, 5,000 on cups and I'm going to spend 5,000 on machines. But instead, if I was the professor of that class, I'd say, here's $20. A plus is the person who turns that $20 into the <laughs> highest amount of money. And you guys have two weeks. I'm reminded of uh, <laughs> one of my all time favorites was Rodney Dangerfield. I just, I just would get such a kick out of him. And he was a guy that I really would have liked to have had the opportunity to meet, but yeah. you know, he had that film back to school okay. and uh, he goes to uh, the college that his son is going to and struggling and dealing with a lot of problems and he had never, you know, gotten his degree. And he's in a business course where this stuffy professor yeah. is talking about it and <laughs> talking about what those things, like what you're doing when you're starting a business. And then, and then he blurts out, oh, you're forgetting a whole lot of stuff. Uh, <laughs> and then everybody is feverishly writing notes because they know that he's the guy that really knows. And I think that <laughs> that is your story, really, well, is that you got into the real game of I'm going to run a team, I'm going to coach a team. I, hey, I'm, I can't just coach because they need people, they need bodies. So I'm going to carry over and operate on some of these other functions. And that was really your education. And it was, yeah, and it was a system. leader that I really respected that said, Dave, you know, um, I know you can do this, but this is what our business and our league and our industry really needs. We, we need you over here. And, and, uh, and I got that. And I'm going to say one other thing about, uh, you got me reflecting a little bit about common uh, traits that the, the ones that I've really looked up to have. And I don't care if you're talking about Mike Illich or Rich DeVos or Tim Markham or many, many others that I could name, Craig Bender certainly. They've learned not to share their dreams with negative people. Oh. You know, there are, um, it takes no education. It takes no real skills. It takes no um, perception or, um, or anything special to be a naysayer. All it takes is the ability to say nay and hell, a goat can do that. Mm -hmm. You know, and, uh, and, it, and it really can be very defeating when you're in those uh, different stages of trying to make this thing happen, even if it's in the early idea stages or if it, or you're pretty far down the road and just spending 15 minutes with somebody who just, you know, can't give you a positive thought or an idea can be very, very debilitating to, to actualizing what you're trying to get done. Yeah. And these people who make it through that, they're unique in that they won't listen to that. Yeah, yeah. But there's an you enormous can't. group of people who are just a couple of percentage points less resilient <laughs> below them that are going to go, uh, okay, well, yeah, like my parents said, focus on this thing. My friends said this wasn't that good of an idea. They're probably right. My girlfriend, <laughs> boyfriend said, yeah, I don't know about that, yeah. Alex. You should maybe rethink the way that you're looking at it which maybe they're right. Maybe they are giving you helpful feedback. Well, from their perspective. Exactly. But they, they don't, you know, they don't see the world the way you do. They, and, and that's all good. You know, we, you know, we have people that are more comfortable working in a, a you know, a job based career for 40 years and doing very well and having their pension and doing those things. But I will tell you this, that an entrepreneur that creates his, businesses, products, and services over time based on what you just said about the likelihood of success. If you've really got the chops for it across the board, which includes not just ability, but the, you know, the determination, well, you're building your retirement every day because when you retire from that career with, uh, you know, uh, 
any one of a number of local Columbus companies you could name. There's so many great companies that you could have a great career with in this part of the country. But when you wrap that up, you can't sell that job, yeah. you know, and that's the difference. I'll give you a personal story. And this is one that for some of my friends, they've heard multiple times, but one of my best friends in college, he lived in the same dorm, uh, same actual uh, fourplex as me. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a teaching major, an education major. And he, we told him about our idea, myself and my business partner at that point in time, Chris, one of my best friends still to this day. We told him we have this business idea and we're 19 year old college kids. We're about as broke as can possibly be. We said, Hey, we're going to start a live entertainment company and we're going to bring in real acts to the greater Ashland area. Ashland was a dull little town. Wasn't much going on. So if you're a college kid, 20, 21, 22, there's really not that much to do other than let's be real, go and drink as much as right. you can. Sure. <laughs> so we said this and his immediate reaction was, I like that idea, but you're not using your own money, right? And we said, well, no one else is certainly going to give us any money. That's for sure. And he said, I just, I would not do that. I think you're throwing your money away. Cause we were talking about putting about, you know, laughable numbers at this point in time, a thousand to two thousand dollars yeah. in a beats. Um, and he said, I, I think you're just throwing that money down the drain. I don't think that you guys should go about this. And we said, Well, you know, we're both in the entrepreneurship major mm -hmm. at the university. And when you are in that major, the expectation is you go on and you do something in the business world, preferably start your own business. Mm -hmm. When you graduate, you're going to go and be a teacher. There's going to be something waiting for you. There's not necessarily going to be something waiting for us other than opportunity. Right. So we're going to do this thing and we appreciate your feedback, but we're still going to do it. So we throw this first event. Um, we bring in a DJ. DJ is about $1,500. We take $500. We build a stage literally with our hands. I don't mm -hmm. want to take too much credit because I'm <laughs> not as handy as my friend who's a farmer who right. built the stage. He brings it in with us. You know, we put this together and then sure enough, we get about 500 people, which was like 200 people over the capacity of this needed, venue. Right. And, what, and what you needed to break even. And we pull about $5,000. So we're like almost three grand into the profit, yeah. which is amazing for us. Hell yeah. And our buddy, he's probably had a couple too many drinks at this point in time, but he grabs me on the right, grabs my business partner, Chris, on the left, and he goes... I want in on this thing, man. <laughs> you guys have, you know, figured this out. <laughs> and he did help us, but uh, we go, hey, man, I, you missed your opportunity. Right. You know, that you had the chance to support us previously, but you didn't see the vision. And I'm not saying he's a bad guy. No. But he had that mentality that someone, again, teachers, not bad people, but that's kind of their perspective on the world is mm -hmm. I get my education degree and then I go on and I become a teacher. It's very regimented. It's very yeah. straight line. Whereas the path. And I know what I'm going to make every month and every year. Absolutely. And I know what I'm building towards my retirement. And that's cool. You know, that's, well, I, I have a special place in my heart for educators. I really do. Some of the most influential people in my life and hell, my brother is a, a hell of a teacher and a hell of a coach. And we need them, you know, <laughs> Absolutely. we need them. And, uh, but yeah, it's, it's a different point of view and it's not a bad point of view. It's just different than ours. Now, Dave, you mentioned a lot of people that uh, have been helpful, influential, good friends throughout your successful growth process. That's something that I recognize in you is very, uh, pronounced. You have that skill to keep everybody together far better than I have. That is evident in my mind because I think in the world that we live in, people get hyper-focused on themselves and forget about their friends that maybe were super close to them. Whereas you can name drop and I'm with you and you got texts coming in from this person. I haven't heard from them in a while. Calls all the time. Do you think that's something that you created, you developed, or is that just part of your personality that you want to keep, you know, you keep your friends around, you keep these, some of them, you know, remote business context, but anytime I ask you, Hey, do you got anybody who does uh, you know, distribution of Pepsi in Florida? You go, I might know the guy. Yeah. I do know that guy. Actually, <laughs> actually it's not a guy. It's a, it's a woman, but I do, I do yeah. know that person. And uh, 
you know, I've been very, very fortunate that um, throughout my life I've been surrounded with with great people uh, that um, from whom not only uh, have I learned so much, and please, uh, I hope uh, your viewers will forgive me if if they uh, view what I'm about to say as uh, sentimental, but I'm a, I'm a real believer that the true definition of success in this realm is the quantity and quality of love you give and get. And I have been extremely blessed in that regard. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I don't want to say that that is a privilege of people who have done well for themselves. But, you know, a lot of people that I know, they're just thinking very selfishly, I mean, I got to make my car payments. Sure. Dave. Like, yeah. I got to, you know, I, I got to make sure that my kids have, you know, food. So I think that my goal is get everybody rich. And then we'll think about like, you know, all of the things that really enrich your lives, mm -hmm. not just your base level sustenance. Mm -hmm. And I think some other countries do a far better job of that than us because they realize that, hey, life is about family and friends. Maybe I don't have the opportunity to get ready. You know, if I live in rural Bangladesh, hey, I'm a farmer. Most important thing is my family. Well, you know, and you just said something, whether you're talking about Bangladesh or whether you're talking about Belgium, uh, a lot of countries, sometimes because of just real world practicalities and other times because maybe their education system in some ways is more advanced. But one of the things that's kind of been a, you know, a pet peeve of mine is, I don't think, and maybe it's changing a little bit now, but I don't think our education system, and I'm talking about grade school, middle school, high school, has done a great job of uh, teaching us the fundamentals of personal financial management, let alone, you know, how to, you know, set your plan for your, uh, for your working life, you know. I wrote and never publish a book about that exact topic. Did you? Yeah. And it's funny because we have a summer intern who comes in. He's on his spring break. So Ben, you, you saw Ben. Yeah, sure. Um, young Ben. He goes to Miami University, and he's actually on his path to becoming a teacher. Uh, one of the things he's in right now is Calculus 3. Now, you and I, we, <laughs> we, we couldn't even begin that class. We, we shouldn't even sit down at no, that class. No. I, was a I don't belong in there. I was a notorious non-note taker. <laughs> so I would just sit there and, you know, try to retain things, which was not a good learning strategy. Uh, but, you know, I made it through. And he was talking to me about Calc 3 and things like that. And I said, well, what's your professor like? And he said, that's the thing. The professor we get is amazing at math but they are not qualified to teach. Mm -hmm. So they have a very, you know, small skill set associated with math application, but their ability to connect with people, which is probably 80% of being a football coach, right, mm -hmm. is not there. And I said, you know, I kind of joked, but I said, you know, how much does that guy know about taxes? Because that's really what you need to be learning about. Mm -hmm. You need to learn how to handle your personal finances, manage your taxes. Oh, and by the way, if you can get one or two rental properties, here's what that looks like into the future. I would take it even further back than that when you're talking to a ninth grader or a 12th grader, you know, uh, what it means when, uh, as a freshman in college, you get a credit card in the mail, oh gosh, what, yeah. what it means, um, when you walk into a place and it says rent to own what it means, you know, uh, when, you know, you sign your first lease or you get your first checking account. These are things, these are fundamental skills that, you know, I, I can tell you certainly when I was going to school, we weren't being taught. And, and even my kids who are in college now, um, I don't think we're being taught that in, in uh, high school. Well, I can speak for my experience and I didn't learn any of that. Yeah. When I graduated college, I went to get my first car that I actually was going to acquire and the dealership said, well, how's your credit? And I said, well, it's good. And they said, is it? And I said, well, I don't know. I don't have any credit. Is non-existent good? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I thought that was good. Right. You know, right. I thought I've never had to use credit. That's a positive thing. Right. And they kind of had to school me that, no, well, you need to build it to be good. Right. And they looked and they said, you have a 550 credit score. And mm -hmm. I said, what does that mean? Yeah. 
And they said, well, Does that, that mean I can get 550 yeah. today? <laughs> uh, they said, well, that means it's going to be hard for you to get this car. Yeah. And I said, oh, why? And they said, well, I, we don't know why. That's yeah. just, that's something that you need to go in and figure out. Yeah. And I was taught from my family and, you know, amazing parents. I owe them a ton for my success. They you absolutely me. do have amazing parents. That, that I'm sure that they'll listen and take uh, stock of that. Yeah. But they didn't teach me, and they, I love them to death, but they followed that very traditional career path. Mm -hmm. You go to school, you get a job, and then you take that job and utilize it to make your income. And why wouldn't they? I mean, because they have been thing. taught to do that. Absolutely. Of course. But they never talked to me about what credit means for your livelihood. Mm -hmm. they, they kind of said that credit is a bad thing because that was sort of, you know, when they were growing up, credit cards were new and they knew about credit card debt. Not right. necessarily credit and credit scores. Right. So I had never built any of that throughout and, my college career. And their parents, you know, were teaching them neither a borrower or a lender be, you know. And, uh, you know, obviously, uh, you know, uh, we owe our kids now, uh, you know, at this stage of the game, and I'm talking about our kids, I'm talking about 13, 14, 15, and through high school, we owe it to them to arm them with the tools they need to do the job they want to do, you know, that they don't even know they want to do yet, but that, you know, their future life. I mean, think of all, <laughs> isn't there a song uh, that begins with when I look back on all the crap I learned in high school, it's a wonder I can think at all. And, uh, uh, you know, it's true. Uh, we need to make sure that we're giving our kids information they can use. Yeah, and, and going back to my first day as the professor of that entrepreneurship class, that's all it really is. It's practical application. Yeah. You know, you yeah. you uh, hopefully they taught them how to change their oil in high school, which they probably didn't, <laughs> but you know, and to do their taxes, which right. I know I'm not the first person to say something like that. But yeah. once they get to the collegiate level, if they're interested in entrepreneurship, it all goes practical. It doesn't become hypothetical. And I thought that was something that at my coll uh, collegiate uh, career they almost were training you to believe that starting a business was not realistic. Yeah, yeah, or, or too risky. Exactly. But think about that. Think about that first, uh, you know, what would you call it, event that you threw, party yeah. that you threw, you know, however you want to look at it. Well, why did you do it when, when your professor said, yeah, man, that could be a little risky. Why did you go ahead and do it? That's a great question. Um, and my friend was the one who didn't believe. My professor was actually the one who encouraged me. I see. And you'll you'll think this is serendipity, but I'm going back to Ashland to speak tomorrow mm -hmm. uh, to see that same professor. And That's awesome. And what he shared with us was in one of my 101 classes, one of my first years at Ashland. It was a pamphlet, and I've tried to find this article since then, and I can't find it. You know, even the World Wide Internet, I cannot find it. I know it exists. But what it said is all of the reasons to start a business while you're still in college. And it was sort of taking the idea of being a collegiate student and flipping on its head. Well, you don't have any money as a college student. Well, you don't have any money to lose. <laughs> well, you know, I don't know that much about business, Okay, well, there's so many people around you who know so much about business. Well, I'm super busy because I have all these college classes. That's your captive audience is the young people that you can tap into. Yeah. So I read that and I was like, oh my gosh, that makes so much sense. Even if this fails, like I'm going to be 21. Like, you know, that's not it for me. Right. I have the rest of my life to figure this thing out. And I mm -hmm. think that's true for anybody at any age. You know, I don't think you ever age out of starting a business. I think the opportunities are there for you and it's just skill development. So we went and we took that idea and we said, Ashland's a little more boring than we hope that it would be. So what can we do? Well, let's bring in some live entertainment. Mm -hmm. Well, how much money do we have? We don't have any, mm -hmm. uh, but how much can we earn this summer? We can earn a you know, thousand, 2000 each. So that's what we earned. We brought it to college and we said, we're going to give it the old college <laughs> try Exactly. And, and it worked. And we ended up running maybe 20 events throughout the remainder of that year and a half while I was still there at Ashland University. And we did very well. And that's yeah. how we got That's how we got initially. together. That's just what I was going to say. I said, I want to get into the event business. Uh -huh. And yeah. my friend said, I know just the guy. Talk yeah. to Dave. And sure enough. And boy, did we do one hell of an event together that, you know, that really made so many things happen. But 
I would uh, summarize, you know, uh, the answer to the question that I asked you, which is uh, why you went ahead and did it anyway. Is just what we've been talking about. It never occurred to you that you couldn't do it. Mm-hmm. And you didn't let negativity thwart you from your dreams. And, and uh, that's what, what it takes. This is something Tim Ferriss said. Um, and, and he puts it into the perspective of, like, what's the worst thing that could happen? Which when you think about that, generally the worst thing that can happen is not that bad. You're sort of mm-hmm. like exaggerating what could mm-hmm. be uh, catastrophizing what could happen. Well, I could run this event and I could lose all my money and, and then what? Well, well, I don't know, probably nothing, you know, I'm already broke. So then I don't have beer money for a handful of months, which (laughs) that would stink. But you know, my parents love me. They'd probably throw me a hundred dollars every couple of weeks. Right. Yeah. So, you know, the (laughs) risks are generally very, very low and we live in the first manageable where, you know, there's so many safety nets out there for individuals that you can probably find your way through anything negative that happens to you, but you get one step closer to the potential positive thing that is going to come about from the situation that you put yourself in. And just like your first arena football teams, you'd look back and go, well, I'd do a lot of things differently. Oh, <laughs> just like my first events, I yeah. would do a ton of things differently, but you were figuring it out as you went. You know, as you say that, I, I really am reminded of my uh, late father, uh, Bob Winham, who was an attorney and uh, a very, very bright man. And uh, he found himself in the unenviable position of writing a letter going to an unknown location to his oldest son. You know, again, that he didn't know where he was, but I had an intermediary that I trusted that could, uh, and I was many, many miles away. I was in Dallas, Texas, and he was in Detroit um, wanting to make sure that I was alive and well and wanted to convey uh, uh, some things to me. And when we were reunited uh, at a quiet moment, he shared something with me that I even mentioned at, when I spoke at his memorial. It was the first thing I mentioned was... You know, brother, there are very few do or die situations in life. And he told me that, but if you face one, you'll handle it. Then he paused and said, and if you don't, you'll be dead. So you don't have to worry about it. Anyway. That's right. <laughs> and there's some, you know, there's some real wisdom in that stupid thing is that, um, you know, uh, fear is, um, is required in life. And it's one of the only two things that motivates any human being to, to do anything. There's only two things that do. One is fear and the other is desire. And, and they're equally important in many ways. I mean, fear makes you look both ways when you cross the street, you know, it keeps your head down in the foxhole, I guess. I've never been in a foxhole, but if I was at war, I'm sure I would have a, a relative amount of fear that would probably be needed. <clears throat> but as it relates to how you live your life, it's far better to dwell on the things you want as opposed to the things you, you know, you fear. And that's what he was trying to say. Yeah, that's, that's really insightful. Um, Dave, I do have some other things to ask you about. So you are one of the better talkers and or salespeople that I have ever met. So thank you. Uh, Coming yeah. from you, that means a lot. Yeah, no, I learned a lot of what I know about <laughs> speaking and selling uh, from you. And I appreciate you saying that. that to sell. I appreciate you saying that very much. You know, it means a lot to me. We've sold lots of brands, but yes, we've sold lots have. of products. Yes, you have. Then. So and continue di- to do so. Yeah. yeah, it's a different process online. You know, you're sure. selling kind of differently, but you know, our clients are really the brands that we represent. So, you know, talk to me about uh, that sales process because I'm an enormous believer in salesmanship. Mm-hmm. If you can sell you can be successful. Yes. So whether that's on the internet or in person, if you want to make a lot of money, go into sales. Don't go in. And I think that a lot of people sort of skip that when they think about making money. They think about, I need to be a doctor, a lawyer, accountant. Well, those are good. Mm -hmm. But the people in those businesses who additionally do very, very well are the accounting sales rep. Mm -hmm. You know, that's how we found our accounting firm salesperson reach out to us, you know, the, the pharmaceutical reps who are selling products to doctors, 
you know, the lawyers, they, they have salespeople too. They have marketing teams. You better believe they teams, do. You better those, believe it. Those, those lawyers are as much salespeople as they are legal counsel, you know? So talk to me about, you know, what you learned about selling because you were selling at some points, you know, as you have said to me, very difficult products, bad teams, average teams, mm-hmm. teams that were very good, but maybe they're not in the premier leagues across right. the world. Right. Uh, what do you think is the key to being a salesperson? Well, I think that, first of all, um, we need to start by talking just for a moment about self-image. And I think self-image is uh, uh, often talked about, but far less often understood concept. We don't have but one self-image. We have several. Uh, I have a self-image as it relates to uh, my profession. I I have a self-image as it relates to being a salesperson, as a brother, a father, a husband, uh, as a dog owner, as a golfer. You know what I mean? You know, you have self-images related to all the things, all the endeavors in your life as a friend, you know. Um, whatever the case may be. And some of those self-images are probably more positive than others because of what you have or have not done in that regard. Um, So when you hear somebody say, you know, I'm not really a salesperson, Mm -hmm. there's a couple of things about that. Their self-image about being a salesperson is is already um, damaged because they don't really even know what sales is yet. But also it's damaged because so many people, and we ende- you encounter this all the time, I encounter it all the time, they think there's something inherently shady yes. about selling. The truth of the matter is selling is teaching. And I was an education major. I was not a business major. I wanted to be a ball coach. I wanted to be the next Woody Hayes, you know. But, um, but I've come to learn you know, like one of the one of the techniques they teach you back in the day about teaching is the whole part whole method, where you kind of pour the whole concept over somebody, then you break it down into its elements, and then you give them the whole again, so that they can come to a level of understanding. Well, that's really what sales is. Um, now it depends on what you're selling. Uh, relationship building plays a key role in that depending on what it is. And I'll use my industry as an example. The selling of tickets um, certainly requires, especially season tickets, that the people that anybody that I start in our industry, I'm trying to get them in the ticket room, selling tickets because it's hard as Mm -hmm. hell. But also you learn how to develop, you know, many relationships with people. But at the end of the day, selling tickets is about having a product that's worth paying to see and having a way within your economic model to be able to get that done. Sponsorship, investment, things of this nature are about relationships. Uh, Any kind of partnership, you know, our philosophy about partnerships is that with new partners, when we're endeavoring to create one, our goal is to create doable, meaningful deals that aren't too heavy of a lift for the other side. So it places you in a position to perform on the thing. And over time you get pretty good at it and it's tempting to try and close something that's bigger maybe than you should. But the problem with that is it taints the relationship to where all they, that other person can think about is the decision they made. And Oh my God, should I have done that as opposed to being focused on your, on the service or product you're providing. So, um, what we do and I can't even tell you how many times I've gone, and hell, I think I've taken you through the training that we do when we're trying to create uh, sponsors and other partners for our businesses. And it's really relationship building, and, and, it, and it can be compared to any type of relationship that you might be interested in, whether it's a new person moves into the house next door, or I like to always say, like, you're in 11th grade and the girl or boy of your dreams is sitting, they must be new. I've never seen her before. They're sitting two rows away. Well, the decisions you made is make associated with, you know, how you might try to start an acquaintance that might even become a, some kind of relationship is pretty critical. And uh, so we try and teach people uh, methods that would work in either instance. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I think you hit a really 
a couple interesting points there. First is that so many people think sales is ugly or that they think sales is something not for them because they're inherently afraid to fail. That's exactly it. Yeah. It's fear-based. Yeah. And and it's also, you know, uh, based on not really understanding what it is, that it truly is oftentimes relationship uh, building. I mean, you think about the favorite restaurants you like to go to, that you return to. You typically get greeted there when you walk in. Somebody typically comes and says, it's nice to see you. Maybe they walk, you know, to the door with you and say, thanks a lot. You know, we appreciate you. Well, what is that? But relationship building, you know. Yeah. And I don't know if you knew this or not, but uh, in my time in the construction industry, there was a lot of knocking doors. Yeah. Hell which, yeah, there was. I mean, you know, that's probably on par with calling about season ticket difficulty. Uh, because <laughs> at least, you know, yeah, yeah, at least it's difficult. Yeah. I mean, I get those calls from some of the teams that want me to look at suites and things like that. I'm like, I don't even, I'm not a huge fan of this sport guys. You know, you're asking mm -hmm. a lot out of me, but that process, the thing that I always told myself is you're doing the person that you're talking to a service because you do have something that they actually need. And I think when you think about it like that, you're not bugging that person that would be the first thing we would tell people don't say hey sorry to bug you right because then you know right. already you've framed it yeah. as i am bugging you yeah so yeah. you know you have to tell that person think about this differently sorry not bugging you and i think there's a you know just you know you got me in kind of my training mode here for a moment don't say i'm sorry to bother you say do you have a minute to talk show them some consideration don't go right to what you're trying to sell because it's assumptive. You know, the, the key to building relationships, in my mind, is putting people in a position to tell them a little bit about yourselves. And, and you know where I'm heading with this. When it comes to building sponsor partnerships, you know, we ask the same four questions all the time because it puts a person in a position to tell them what it is they really want, to tell you what it is they really want. Yeah, I I, uh, I think that in education in business is an education in sales. I mean, if Indeed. you get into any industry, look, no business flourishes without selling a lot of product. <laughs> you know, there there ain't no business that doesn't sell anything and does very very well. And usually, that salesperson. This is one of the things that I tell young people, especially if they're trying to earn a high income. That's a certain thing. That is a a specific certain thing, mm -hmm. and you have to yes sacrifice on certain other things if that is what you want. But if you want to earn a high income, get as close to the money as you can. There's no one closer than the salesperson. Right. Right. Exactly. So you can, and there's no more one, there's no one more valuable to the process. Absolutely. That's where you find out where your champions are. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. So I think that, you know, you and I have both gotten a long-term education in the sales process, which whether our job is now being the salesperson or as understanding that as the value add to the business, I think that that is so invaluable. And that is something also that additionally is not taught at a high level in I'm universities. I'm glad you said it that schools. way. Let, let, me, let me react to that just for a moment. I oftentimes, when I'm, uh, and I've, I've taught, you know, to sports uh, organizations, both at the professional and collegiate level, you know, for the last 20 years, I've, I've trained thousands of people on, on sponsorship and corporate partnership, uh, relationship building, sales and service fulfillment, all of the above, and performance, proof of performance, everything associated with it. And when I started, oftentimes, I explained to them that when I first started, when I was with the Detroit Drive in, you know, at Olympia Arenas Incorporated, the very first thing they uh, gave me to do in postseason uh, was to be the only non-playing or coaching employee of this new indoor lacrosse team mm. that they brought in, which means I was selling tickets, I was selling sponsorship, I was booking the travel for the team. I was I was just like dunked in this tank of of opportunity to learn, you know, and and uh, I kind of equate it to this, you know, I I was trying to sell sponsorship, and I'm telling you. I did not have the first idea of what I was doing. I didn't even really understand what the sponsorship inventory or elements were other than, you know, 
what my common sense was telling me, but I had two things. One, I had a hell of a lot of enthusiasm, so there was mm. that. I, but I was surrounded with the best in the business. And if I, you know, pestered them enough, talking about saying, don't say you're bothering them, but that they would share what they knew. But still, it was kind of like someone that wants to play golf. You know, if you just throw a bucket of balls out there and you start hacking away, not knowing what you're doing, you'll, you know, you'll connect on every 10th one and it'll go and that'll keep you motivated. But if you take two lessons, four lessons, six lessons, eight lessons, you're going to get better in a hurry. And that's really what is a big thing that's required. You just talked about lack of training. If we teach people, you know, how to do the, 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 the job and then you let them pour their own energy and, and personality into it, good things can happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And while we're talking about young people and learning some of the skills and trades, I know there's going to be people who are listening, who want to get into the sports world. Mm -hmm. They probably don't care at what level they mm -hmm. just, they want in, you know, then they'll make their mark. What advice would you have for those people? And where would you tell them to start that process? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I, I think I quoted Bo Schembechler, uh, the longtime head coach at the University of Michigan, as saying the best way to, in, in your career to get where you want to go is to surround yourself with people who are doing what you want to do. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> when I was a kid, I mean a high school kid, I really thought that I wanted to be in uh, radio and television, he said, into the microphone. Um, and, and I've been fortunate to be able to do a lot of that in my career. Um, but what I did was I just started to become a fixture at some of the radio and TV stations uh, in Detroit, which was a, and remains a rich media market, to kind of uh, learn about what they were doing, be exposed to it, and also meet some people and make some relationships. I don't know if as a 14-year-old I was thinking it through. I was just interested in it and wanted to be around it. But that's the first thing. You've got to find ways to um, get acquainted with people in the organizations that you think are worthy of uh, wanting to be a part of. Then I would say when you approach them, and it doesn't matter who you approach, if you're a entry-level or even less than entry-level candidate, for a sports or entertainment organization, go there, uh, introduce yourself, look them in the eye, shake their hand to the degree people are shaking hands these days, hmm. and explain to them that you're in a, this is what your interest is, and you really look up to and admire what's being done here, and would just like to find a way to help and be a part of it. I mentioned that eight-month campaign that landed me my first job in arena football. Mm -hmm. I never asked for a job. Um, I talked to a lot of people and a lot of people's secretaries and a lot of people's receptionists and assistants before I ever got to any general managers or presidents. And my message was I, this whole arena football thing is so intriguing to me. I really get it. I see how this could be really something special. And I just want to help. And if you don't mind, I'll, I'll go a little further. Tell me uh, all of it. Yeah. So uh, there were two people that I was really, <laughs> you know, as I said, the laws have changed that I was stalking. One was Jim uh, Foster, who was, uh, is the founder of Arena Football and was its first commissioner. And the other was Jim Lights, who was Mr. Illich's, uh vice president of the Red Wings, and really everything at Joe Louis Arena. And I made it my business once I decided this is something I want to be involved in. I made sure, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, I there was never going to be a week because we were months and months away from any decision being made. There wasn't going to be a week where they didn't hear from or about me. Well, um, I traveled from Grand Rapids to Detroit many times to visit and uh, always with a goal in mind, you know, but never did I ask for a job. And I traveled to Chicago. I was kind of at Grand Rapids equidistant to the league office 
to get acquainted, to make sure that everybody in both of those organizations knew who I was and knew that I was a young football coach that was, you know, looking to make moves and grow in the profession. Well, one day uh, I arrived at the, uh, in my nice blue suit, I arrived at the new Arena Football League offices to find that everybody there was painting that day. So I went out to my truck and I got out of my suit and put on my uh, jeans and a T-shirt and I painted those offices with them that day. Another uh, time I went there and back then they had rules in arena football where players played both ways. They played offense and defense. And Ray Yock, a great guy who was the director of football operations, was trying to figure out a way to officiate that. Mm. And uh, the next day... He had, via a FedEx delivery, a chart that the Arena Football League used for like 18 years until they stopped making players play both ways that I created because it was something I knew he needed. He didn't have an abundance of time to, to work at it, and I uh, you know, got that to him. And, and so you look for, um, you try to develop an understanding of what is it that they need? Help help them get what it is that they need and what they want, and they'll see the value of you being involved. Do you think at some capacity young people have sort of lost that idea of I'm going to bust my ass and I'm going to put myself in front of this person? Because maybe I just don't see it. I know you got a couple of kids who are kind of about that age. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have uh, Will who... Uh, Probably served in the United States Coast Guard prior to going to college. Who's a junior at uh, Ohio, the Ohio State University, and uh, works for us full time. Good catch there. Yep. Yeah. And his uh, younger brother Stevie Ray Winham uh, also works full time for us, and is a senior at Ohio State. And uh, um, so I, I certainly, um, you know, I'm exposed to that every day. But I, I would respond to uh, a question that you just asked that I'm really glad you asked. Throughout, um, I'd say, from the late 90s till about 10, 12 years ago, I really think what you're alluding to is really what was happening. Like, uh, so many young people viewed their graduation from college as their arrival, as opposed to a departure point, which is what it is. Graduating college, you know, you don't get paid for that. Mm -hmm. You know, you you might you might get a uh, graduate assistantship to go get more education, or you might uh, enter the job force. But it's a departure point, not an arrival point. I would say, though, uh, you know, dating back to like, oh hell, you know, twelve years ago or so, fourteen years ago, when the economy really changed. For the first meaningful time, you know, probably since the late 60s, early 70s, that started to develop, and you're one of them, oh, by the way, that didn't just think, oh, I've got my bachelor's degree, you know, give me my check. You know, some kids were having some tough times, and and uh, they were having tough times getting through school, mm -hmm. and their they saw that their parents were... You know, losing jobs and and uh, and ha and and you know, doing the best they could to deal with financial challenges. So they were less entitled. Uh, you know, about the time you came out, than uh, than they had been for the at least the previous twenty years or so when I was in a position to you know uh, be in uh, business leadership positions. I do think that now, based on the kinds of changes that you opened the show talking about. I think kids are a little bit more savvy than to think just because they've got a bachelor's degree that, you know, they're going to get a career level job. Yeah, well, I mean, two, really two interesting thing, things happened 10 to 12 years ago. 08 financial crisis, which, as you just discussed, really hit my family because that's when I was going through school, right. myself and my brother at yeah. the same time. Right. So there's a lot of stress on our family. But the other thing that happened around that period of time was that right there? Yeah. The development of the iPhone. Right. Which I think has changed our culture probably as much, if not more, than anything else that has ever been developed. Yeah. You know, Elon Musk talks about, you know, 
integrating the computer and the person, but he goes, it's already happened because your cell phone is always within arm's reach right. of you. And right. if it's not, oh, I got anxiety. Where, yeah. Where's my phone? Oh my gosh. Where is it? I, I walked in here today into your beautiful offices and uh, realized I didn't have it and turned right around, went and got it. Yeah. 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 And it's like, well, you know, who's going to call me? Who's going to contact me? It's probably just going to be stuff that can wait, but we've created this idea. I don't think externally, but internally in our own heads that I need to be connected to that because I need to check my email. I need to check my text. Well, what if Dave's texting me? I would say it's it's half that. But the other thing is anything that you're wondering about, have in mind, uh, you know, you want to you want to look it up. The world's greatest library is in your pocket. Yeah. You know, there there's nothing that you can't chase down with your mobile phone. And, and that's that is. I mean, that's up there with, uh, you know, it's probably beyond the internal combustion engine and uh, space flight. You know, I mean, it is like maybe the biggest thing ever. You know, I actually talk about this a good amount. A lot of people really hate Jeff Bezos. Mm -hmm. Why? I don't necessarily know other than he's a billionaire. And yes, there are some questions to be asked about the working conditions of the people at Amazon. Okay, well, there's a million people who work at Amazon. So yeah, I'm sure there's a, a sliding scale of how great that job is. But one of the things that I'll quickly say to people who want to, you know, talk badly about Amazon or Jeff Bezos or, you know, anyone within that ecosystem is he gave you the library of Alexandria within two clicks. What else do you want from him? Right. You know? No one has ever... I have Kindle Unlimited. I just got Kindle Unlimited. It's insane. I can l read any book for free instantly. It doesn't even really make sense. And that's just a book, let alone, yeah. you know, I transition over to YouTube and want to watch a video of someone changing their Honda Element light. Like, how do I do this? <laughs> and it's, boom, there yeah. it is. Yeah. You know? So it's a remarkable thing that, you know, the internet has sort of developed. And I don't want to defend everything that Jeff Bezos does or is, but... Yeah. You know, I think of capitalism as just that. If you want something, you can go out and get it from the person who is offering it. You know, we wanted to have a beer tonight. Sure. No one forced us to buy this beer. We chose to buy that beer. Right. And that, to me, seems like a fair transaction between two equal parties who are deciding, I want that thing if you're going to offer it at a good and reasonable price. And you know, this wasn't the best beer that I've ever drank, but I liked it. It was yeah, good sure. enough, yeah. you know, yeah. and uh, that's that. You know, I'll go back and I'll buy something different if I'm not interested in it. But, you know, someone like Jeff Bezos, he's providing the exact same amount as he's getting back. Now, you could say that's unfair, but that's just your perspective on how much he has you aren't really thinking about how much he has given out to individuals, whether that be consumers, employees, shareholders. And that was one of the things that Elon Musk said. Uh, he was getting criticized by Elizabeth Warren, and I don't want to get political, mm -hmm. but he goes, I didn't decide what the price of Tesla was. The shareholders decided that. You know, right. She goes, no one should be a billionaire. And he goes, well, I didn't force anyone to make me a billionaire. The shareholders made me a billionaire because they thought that the price of Tesla was worth so much. And I thought that was kind of, you know, mm -hmm. eye opening and insightful, you right. know, from a, a clearly very intelligent guy, you know, how he thought about the economic landscape. And, you know, I, I sort of think about it similarly, that if people want to give you that m amount of money, you're not harming them. You're not taking advantage of them. It's a, it's a generally fair and equal trade. Well, I, I agree, and, and as you were saying that, um, I kind of my mind went back also to the uh, question about what people should do. You know, um, I would say that in your industry, <laughs> what minute parts of it I think maybe I have a handle on, and probably don't, but at least you know I think I have a general understanding. Um, boy, you talk about having to educate yourself. And having to go out there and get this thing figured out. And it was really the birth of your business was that process of realizing the need and getting it figured out, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, we were, you know, hacking down, uh, you know, weeds with a machete trying to fight through the <laughs> wild, wild west. I mean, um, we did not know what we were doing. And that is one of the things that, you know, when I go to Ashland tomorrow and I talk to the young people, I will absolutely positively say is, 
you don't need to know everything. You just need to trust yourself and your ability to figure it out. So if you think like, I don't know that much about amazon.com selling on it, that's going to be a lot. It's a unique experience. That's fine. You just have to trust yourself and your ability to figure it out. You just said it right there. If you don't trust yourself, well, then we got to go back to the start. We got to figure out, well, why don't you trust yourself? What have you not done to prove yourself? Which I think there are a lot of people who have never proven their actual ability to do things. You know, I don't want to toot our horns, but Mm -hmm. no matter what challenge gets thrown in front of, we get, you and I both get sued tomorrow for something that we said offensive here today. (laughs) We're like, okay, well, this stinks, but like. I have laid a foundation of figuring this thing out previously that I know I'm going to be able to deal with this thing. And I think a lot of people get really flustered, really frustrated by small minutia details because they don't have an experience of figuring things out. And I think... Well, being, they also have that fear-based attitude we talked about. If you... not Excuse the brief interruption. <clears throat> excuse me. But what you come to learn... And the sooner you learn it, the better you're going to be. And you cannot be an entrepreneur if you don't learn this, is that in within every problem is an opportunity. And when a problem arises, or even before it arises, you've got to stop and say, what's good about this? And what can we, what can we do with this to get us, you know, further ahead, you Mm -hmm. know, and towards our, our mission and goal. Yeah. So we were just talking about, uh, Brad, um, Brad was commenting that we are currently on a March weight loss challenge, sort of a transformation challenge more than Mm -hmm. anything. Uh, And Brad was saying, you know, he can't have a light beer, even one as light as this one, Labatt's. Yeah. Uh, Canadians, I think, as they call them. Uh, Oh, that's Molson. That's Molson? Yeah, Labatt is blue. Well, you're probably a Detroit guy hanging around that border more often than I. And, you know, that's kind of a thing. Uh, Certainly in my youth and for the youths of many generations before mine in Detroit, it was all about Stroh's. Stroh's beer was the thing, man. And and, uh, and then the brewery uh, went away and and the brand, you know, became one more of those just generic, you know, swill brands that, you know, has no real identity other than the can or bottle they're at. But uh, Stroh's... Definitely had an identity, and a lot of Detroit beer drinkers went to Labatt's after uh, Stroh's went away. Yeah. Well, cheers, my friend. Cheers. It's good, to, great, have you, good great, to have you out here. So great to be here. I'm so proud of you, brother. No, I, I, I thank you for that, and you know we're uh, we're still pushing forward. We got a lot of opportunity ahead of us. You're absolutely right. You know, I just heard someone say that it's not that you ever level up. It's just that you move into a new category where now you're the smallest guy. Yeah. <laughs> so I feel like we're sort of on the border there yeah. of moving into that next category where now we're the little man mm-hmm. on the totem pole. Uh, so Dave, one fun, fun, fun fact about you is I know you used to be at one point in time, the strength and conditioning coach of the Detroit Red Wings. Yes. Yeah, I was. And that was all part of that um, move from being a college coach uh, to going into arena football with, and it was so exciting that I got to go back to my hometown of Detroit, be part of an original professional football team, be a coach on that original uh, professional football team, and win a championship that first year. Uh, so many special things happened. And uh, uh, two guys that I've mentioned, uh, the late, great uh, Gary Vito and and Mr. Jim Lights took me aside and uh, – Mr. Illich's uh, suite after uh, the next night, we had a party in his suite at the arena and said, hey, listen, look at you. You know, you wear us out. You, you, uh, you know, you just keep keep getting after it and after it and after it. And now look at you. You're a you're a champion. And uh, listen, we don't know what we're going to have you do. But um, Monday, come in and uh, we don't want you to, you know, to leave us because back then, most of the positions associated with uh, arena football were seasonal, but they didn't want me to leave. And they uh, started, you know, teaching me the business and got me involved with that lacrosse team. But by the time the second season came around, uh, Gary Vito knew 
that I had a background in, in strength and conditioning training and was very active in that with the football programs that I had coached over the previous seven years. And they had a, a player who actually was coming out of incarceration and he was a, a great player and, uh, and his name was Bob Probert and Bob Probert was, uh, the heavyweight champion probably of all time of hockey enforcers. Mm-hmm. And, and all you have to do is look him up and you can see how beloved he, he was to this day. And he's a great, great guy, but a lot of really great people have bad problems. And he had some addictive issues that, uh, got him in, in trouble as, do many people in every walk of life, not the least of which is <laughs> sports and entertainment. Mm. But um, they asked me to train him, and then they added another player uh, for me to train, and then they added a, another player who was injured to help him, and uh, that led to them offering me the position. And I was the first strength and conditioning coach. This would have been in 1990. Uh, the first strength and conditioning coach uh, for the Detroit Red Wings, and I think maybe only the second ever in the NHL. And the thing that was so cool about that was, you know, hockey really at that time didn't have much in the way of of, uh, in-season or off-season strength and conditioning programs. And uh, so I was coming into a a very – awesome opportunity to be able to both teach and learn and but also it was so cool to be able to be just dropped into another professional sport that's at the highest level and see how they do things and uh, some interesting things happened as a result one thing I like to tell is uh, we got through our first training camp and if you're a strength and conditioning coach in any sport uh, training camp means fitness testing and getting your systems and structures and reporting devices installed. It's a big part of what you do in the preseason. And we had just broke camp and um, I went into, you know, the, in the locker room, they had some, a coach's locker room inside it. And I walked in there and asked the guys just kind of in general, you guys videotape your games, right? And back then it was tape. It was, you know, cassettes, right? And they go, of course. Well, why don't you video practices? And because uh, that we in football, we'd been doing that for a long time, you know. And they laughed and laughed and laughed. And they, it was like, why in the f would we video practice? Hmm. And I said, well, you know, wherever you happen to be on the rink in a drill or in a scrimmage or whatever, you see what you see at that moment in time. And there's an abundance of other things that you don't see. And even 15 seconds of video might be more effective in teaching a guy that's not quite getting what you want. If you can show him himself, you know, in that drill or in that, you know, coming out or whatever it is uh, during a scrimmage, you've got a real teaching aid there. And the head coach said, if you want to video practice, go ahead and do it. And so I did it for like three practices. And, hell, there's not an NHL team now that doesn't have probably three video people. And, uh, and you know, practice is a huge part of it. And there's not one aspect of a football practice, even at the high school level, that doesn't get, you know, get shot now. But And there are other stories like that. But in much the same way, I learned things about how they did things that were really valuable to me in my football coaching. It's interesting you say that. I have a friend who has a startup that is almost exclusively around filming all of the games that high school play, high school age players, not necessarily high school games, but club games around that, mostly outdoor, mostly soccer. Uh, But his whole startup is around getting all of that footage and being able to connect it to college coaches. When I played, having a video of yourself. And then editing it was like very high tech. Highlight, yeah, highlight yeah. reel. Hell yeah. yeah. You had to have your highlight Damn reel. Damn right. But that was still high tech. Like, you know, to have a single game recorded was like one kid on the team thought that he was going to be the guy and he would get that. Like his dad would pay for the footage to sure. get an AV mm-hmm. guy to come out and do it. 
Um, now it's like, uh, okay, I just have to click an app and get in and it's $20 for that game sure. or whatever. Right. I played great. Let me download that game mm -hmm. instantly. Yeah. You know, it's just an interesting, uh, time and place in the, the world. No doubt. No doubt. And, uh, you know, there's really nothing that, a uh, an athlete, uh, can't, you know, get recorded and, there's nothing that uh, uh, somebody that's interested in looking at them can't access. Well, I brought that up to ask you to give Brad a little bit of advice to help him hit his fitness goals. Uh, well, you know, what did the Detroit Red Wings teach you about <laughs> uh, getting lean? Well, I would tell you this about any fitness program as it relates to the exercise side of it. The number one key thing uh, for any of us uh, that is... Uh, seeking to uh, to get started on and most particularly stay with an exercise program, the most important factor in that is what? What do you think? Do you have a, a guess? Oh, it's a diet. No, no, no. I'm talking about the exercise side of it. Oh. What's the most important factor associated with staying with a new exercise program? My stance on that would be something that you enjoy doing. Okay, and that's what a lot of people would say, and it's it's certainly important. You're not going to do something you hate every day. I see a lot of people who go, I know that I have to run, insert, you know, whatever exercise here, mm -hmm. run, lift, right. uh, row, swim to get fit. I think mm -hmm. running is the common one. Sure. Just unfortunately, I think for a lot of people, because that's what's been ingrained in our heads as the exercise and they go, but I hate running so much that I can't ever envision myself doing it repeatedly, but I'm still going to make that my Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. Yeah. And it's like, you're not going to, you're not going to force yourself to do that forever. And, and believe me, when I tell you, your brain is way smarter than that. Your brain will tell you, screw this. Man. We are we're not, not running. We're, uh -uh. Not, we're not doing this tomorrow morning. You might've done it this morning. We're not doing it tomorrow morning, but, and, and enjoyment and is a part of it but the key uh factor in uh staying with an exercise program is finding a part of your day within which you can make it happen some people you know they want to get up 90 minutes earlier in the morning and knock it out and that's cool some people just look forward to the end of work and they i think i saw you in the weight room when i walked in here today at 5:30 and, uh, you know, but you, the key thing is making it a convenient part of your day and your week. I personally, on weekdays, nights, I like to do it at the end. On weekends, I like to knock out my workouts before, and it works for me, you know, and, and uh, that's really a key part of it. But there are, there are three real aspects to most people's uh, personal fitness quest. One part of it is exercise. One part of it is diet. And the other part of it is behavioral change. You know, if, if you have behavior that is, uh, and we've all been there, that is causing your fitness to suffer, well, then you got to understand the importance for figuring out the techniques for changing that behavior. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think you hit it on the head. And that's half of doing things you don't like mm -hmm. is trying to fit that into a time that you know you aren't going to stick to. I, <laughs> that's that's well stated too. Yeah. <laughs> you sabotage yourself. Oh, yeah, you right. say, I'm going to get up at 530 every morning and then go for a run. I hate waking up that early though. And I hate running. So it could, it could happen. Yeah. You know, yeah, it could yeah happen. you might do it once, yeah. twice, you know, but how long is that willpower going to last? You know, yeah. the, the willpower part of it is a very weak muscle in the human existence. <laughs> Stronger on some people, you know, but it's not going to carry you to the finish line for the next 60 years. Let me tell you, no, human intelligence rarely triumphs over human nature. Mm. And, uh, you know, certainly you're not going to convince your brain uh, that uh, we're going to get up at 530 in the morning if you're not a morning person and go run five miles if you hate running. It's just not going to work out. But um, I would say another thing is managing, especially your starting out expectations. There is absolutely, and you're a young man, 
There is not one damn thing wrong with walking for 30 minutes for a while and building some good habits and then adding on to that. You know, um, that's actually a pretty good successful plan. And, and, and as a young person, that walking can turn into jogging and running relatively quickly. But if, you know, you're not at a fitness level to be able to run or even jog a couple hundred yards, well, don't. Go for a walk. Uh, I can tell you that, you know, I'm, a hell, I'm three times your age, um, and walking has done a hell of a lot uh, for both my, <laughs> my physical and mental uh, fitness <laughs> over the last uh, couple of years for sure. You know, what I've said to many people before is if you you don't want to be, you know, an athlete, whatever it is, that's fine. If you walk 30 minutes a day and you eat whole foods, so not pota- potato chips are not, not a whole food, foods, yeah. whole foods, you will stay lean, you will stay healthy. That's it. Whole foods, 30 minutes. Whole foods, 30 minutes. As I've gotten older, one thing that has helped me too and... and and I lost a lot of weight in the last few years. Um, I had a, a COVID setback, and you know I've had to work my way back up to my uh, uh, exercise levels that I've built up over the last couple of years. But um, when you eat is, I think, um, very, very helpful too. I never really happened to be a guy that wanted to eat in the morning. I don't anymore. I don't. I eat from noon to eight or nine o'clock at night, and that made a big difference for me. Now, someone else might be the opposite. They want to. Eat. They're they're ripping hungry when they get out of bed, and that's cool. Well, you know, wrap it up around five. You know, don't don't. You know, there's there's so much uh, so many calories associated with eating longer than you need to be eating. You know every day i actually have had a lot of success i think not intentionally converting a lot of folks in the office to that but i was very regimented ben you know ben yep. is is also very regimented we eat at noon mm-hmm. we, first meal does not happen before noon Me either yeah so now almost all the guys are like well there's no technical lunch break but Everybody kind of eats at noon now, and I would say, Brad, most people it's their first meal. I mean, I don't want for speak me it for is everyone. for sure. Yeah, and and that was not a big sacrifice for me. Yeah, because I never really enjoyed eating in the morning anyway. That is such a short process of acclimation that yeah. I think people go, "Oh my gosh, I always eat breakfast." I'm like, "Hey, just start by moving your breakfast back an hour, and then two hours, and then a third hour before you know it, that was your first meal of the day at noon." And uh, and hey, if you got to start at 11, then just wrap it up by 7. You know, yeah. It's no big deal. And I think there's so many applications from exercise, diet, to business. You know, the first one that I think of is doing things that you like. When it comes to business, if you hate what you're doing, it's not going to last forever. It might work for a short period of time. Again, that willpower muscle might work for a little while, and you might be able to do it. But I've said this before, the whole goal of business is to put yourself in a position that you're going to have that freedom and you're going to have that happiness. Why would you start from a position of, I hate what I am doing? And even and when you think about it, even the stuff you love is going to have aspects of it that you don't enjoy at For all. Sure. So, so let's not, uh, you know, let's, if we don't like uh, digging coal, let's not start the day by going into the coal mine, you know, let's, let's do things. And I like to make that joke too, you know, when, uh, you know, people, you know, we're, we're, we're very blessed that we get to do some cool things. I mean, we make movies, we put on concerts, we put on pro sports events, we uh, get to train people about, you know, what we do and how we do it, get to meet some really cool people, we get to work with some really great people. So when somebody is, you know, I, I call the, not our office in Dallas, but the, the one uh, in Hilliard, I refer to it as our shop because it's it's got like bay garages on the bottom that we use for studio work. And then the offices above and they 
you know, they see us having a beer at the bar at the shop and they make a comment. And I, I always just say, Hey, listen, you chose your, you know, you chose your profession. I chose mine. <laughs> but speaking of that shop, Brad, we got to get you there. Cause the guitar collection and the cast of characters that you have <laughs> on the wall the artwork it, is pretty cool. Is, it's oh, a gallery, for oh my sure. Gosh. Yeah. I joke to you that we don't have the same amount of style. And you oh, go, you got a pretty cool place You here. go, man, we're in a style business. You know, <laughs> we got to have that, you know? Well, and what's really cool is uh, with some certain exceptions that are there for a reason, pretty much every framed piece you see on the wall represents some work we did, whether it was a concert or a football season or a television show or a movie you know we've been very fortunate to be able to do some really cool fun things yeah and i feel you know very uh appreciative to have been a part of some of those things for a small window and i got some of that artwork myself yeah man and uh we should we should at least mention that we uh um uh, i got introduced to uh, you and i and i gotta tell you this is one thing that i would recommend uh, whether they're young people starting out or established people in their business. One thing that I, I think <laughs> Boo, my wife Jenny, shakes her head about from time to time, if somebody wants to meet with me, I meet them. You know, if they want to pitch me on something, now maybe sometimes it'll be on a Saturday or a Sunday because there's only so many hours in a weekday and we got to get things done. But if somebody really wants to meet with me, I meet them because I want to hear what they have to say. I want to see and feel their presentation because uh, maybe I'm going to meet somebody that uh, needs to be part of our organization, or maybe I'm going to learn a technique or I'm going to hear something that is a little different. And that's exactly how we met. You know, uh, I think we had uh, uh, some snacks over a conference table and just started to get acquainted. And then, uh, you joined our organization while still a student, right? You were still in school Correct, and, yeah. and uh, doing your shows. And we did a, a, a show that to this day, together we did a show called The Free For All at Columbus Commons that to this day is among the greatest shows that ever was presented at that awesome space. And we had a capacity crowd of 7,000 people, not one of whom had to buy a ticket. Mm -hmm. They got their tickets yeah. by visiting sponsors or getting online to connect with a sponsor. And they saw it was the night before the opening game of uh, of uh, the Ohio State football season, the opening home game. And we had uh, a local artist, Erica Blinn, my, uh, my, just one of my favorite people in the whole world, such a talented person and great person. And then uh, because it was the night before the opening game, we had Rick Derringer right. and his band. And Rick Derringer was the front man of a band called the McCoys that had a hit that some Buckeyes have heard of called Hang On Sloopy. Then we had Sly doesn't perform anymore, but we had the Family Stone, mm -hmm. Rock and Roll Hall of Famers, who put on one of the all-time great performances that I've ever witnessed. And the uh, the headliner was uh, Blues Traveler. Yeah. And... Uh, um, when Blues Traveler, I mean, when, when the Family Stone was on stage, every member of Blues Traveler, every member of Rick Derringer's band, Erica Blinn, her band, and everybody that could get on the apron of that stage was checking that out just because it was, it was a very, very special moment. And then, uh, Blues Travel, Traveler killed it in front of 70,000 people, fireworks and, it was just a, a hell of an event, but it led to, as you will remember, we were at World of Beer um, in the building where our office used to be on uh, on uh, Front Street, and Rick Derringer, the front man of the McCoys who made Hang On Sloopy famous, said, you know, Dave, uh, um, Sloopy turns 50 next year. We should do something, and by something, I'm sure he meant you should book me for 50 shows around uh, the state of Ohio. And, but what we did end up doing was creating our first feature length film and it's called hang on Sloopy, the movie. And it won a number of awards and, uh, has really done well. And it got us into that space that, you know, hell, we just finished one two weeks ago about the hundredth anniversary of Bowling Green football. And it's become part and parcel of what we do now. Yeah. And I, I see that as, one of the skills that you have is just 
pulling those pieces together, pulling ideas together, pulling people together and utilizing them for, for good, but also, you know, from a business perspective, things that are strategic for you. And remember we did, uh, I, I know you'll well remember, we did another free for all show in the brewery district with 10,000 maniacs. And yep. that was a lot of fun. And, um, just, you know, one good thing leads to another. Yeah, and just a learning process, you know, all those things, mm -hmm. good, bad, indifferent oh, across the board. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt about yeah. that. So I, I would say my last question for you, Dave, and you've been super, uh, you know, thoughtful and uh, giving with your time here, but if you have someone that is a young person and they're looking to get into the business world, maybe the sports world, you know, maybe just trying to find their way, what piece of advice would you give them that's going to get them going in the right direction? You and I can't give them all of it, mm -hmm. but we can push them in the right direction. The most important assets you have in um, starting out your career, irrespective of what it is, you know, people will say it's not what you know, it's who you know. We've, we've heard that so many times. Well, if you don't know them, go make that relationship. Mm. Even if you have to work through, you know, seven people to ultimately, you know, meet that person that you're trying to meet, um, you know, surround yourself by, with people who, uh, you know, who are doing the things you want to do. And believe me when I tell you, um, one of the things we talk about in our sales training with, like, say, it's a new organization, it's a new arena football team in a, in a, in a market, or it's a new radio station or television station or company of any kind in a new market. If, even if you're young, even if you're very young, if you're in high school, but you reach out to other corporate citizens from a standpoint of I'm one positive corporate citizen reaching out to another, and you say, my name's Dave Winham, <laughs> you know, I'm from the team management. And then you explain that, you know, as whatever your mission is, let's say it's sponsorship, um, you know, we are just getting started here in Atlanta. And um, we today we're talking about organizations and businesses that we really at least need to be acquainted with, irrespective of whether we're going to do business together or not. And certainly yours came up. I'm reaching out today to see if it might be possible for us to spend 20 or 30 minutes together just to see if there's ways we might be able to be of service to each other, but at least to be able to be acquainted. Most positive corporate citizens will say yes to that request and they will visit with you. And the ones that say no are doing you a favor because mm. they weren't yeah. going to do anything with you anyway. So um, I can tell you some of the very, very best relationships we've ever had. Hell, the way I met you was a, a mutual acquaintance reached out and he thought that you should meet me. And he called to see if I would meet you. And I don't know if he knew, but I say yes to that request every single time. That's actually a big thing that I do here at this company. While you walked in the door, I was on the phone with your good friend who was, mm -hmm. uh, was connecting me with another good friend. Right. And when I heard about his businesses, the list being lengthy, the yeah. zeros continuing to add up as <laughs> he told me about the certain deals and yeah. number of oh, yeah. businesses that he had. Yeah, no joke. Know, yeah. With with the words oil and gas yeah. coming up, investments, multiple businesses, mm -hmm. you know, so on and so forth. I went, hold on, who is this guy? Um, but I, I didn't know who that individual was when your friend told me to connect with him via a call. And right. I just said, yeah, let's do it. Sure, of uh, course. You know, we have a finite amount of time, but when you get on one of those calls, you go, oh boy, I don't know if anything else that I'm doing could be more potentially important right. than this. And sometimes they're nothing, you know, to your point. But very seldom are they really nothing because um, oftentimes uh, somebody in their approach, pitch, if it's a pitch, will say or do something that you'll, you'll note, True. you know, uh, actually in your notebook or just mentally note. Um, 
I could give you some silly, crazy ex examples, but when I'm asked to meet, I meet. And it might, again, it might be a Saturday. It might be, a, you know, it might be 6 o'clock on a, on a Tuesday or something. But, but I'll do it because uh, I, I feel like uh, I can gain as much as, as certainly anybody that's asking to meet with me. <laughs> yeah, and, and I've found that similarly, that people we meet, whether we can help you now or later, and if you're playing the long game, like we talked about with entrepreneurship, you're eventually going to have that need for that person or help them or they help you. And, and, and here's what ends up happening when you have that kind of attitude about it, is you very seldom really say no to anybody. What you end up doing, it could be something that's just not, this is not a fit for us. I appreciate that you brought it to me, and I appreciate that so-and-so said you should really bring this to me. But let me tell you, this is the person you probably ought to be talking to. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, that's, you know, how it happens, right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, Dave, I cannot thank you enough for coming out, hanging out with us for a little while here. And uh, we're certainly going to have you on again. So well, if there's anything you didn't get out, don't you worry. <laughs> well, first of all, it's my absolute pleasure to be here. Anything for you, anytime, Alex. But um, I'm honored to be the the on your first episode. It's really great, and I appreciate you having me. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you. You bet. And thank you for anybody who's listening. Uh, we will certainly have more episodes. We're going to try to do this minimally on a monthly basis, hopefully more like on a multi-weekly basis. One of the things about this podcast, though, is we would like to get people here physically in person. Because I think that there's a big difference between doing it on Zoom or Skype or whatever your favorite method of connecting is, uh, and then doing it in person. Can I end uh, you by asking you a question? Is there a way folks can get in touch with you if they have an idea for the show or if they want to learn more about your company? Yeah, that's a great uh, thing. So uh, the contact form on our company, MixSolutions.com, M-I-X-T, uh, solutions, multiple solutions, plural, Dot com comes directly to me. Uh, there also is a downloading dollars uh, URL. It uh, is my email, AVJ, that's Alexander Verlin Johnson, J, at downloading dollars, again, plural, mm -hmm. dot com. I would love to have some additional guests on. So, Dave, yeah. I'm sure you got a wealth of people. But Absolutely. at the same time, if someone hears this and they go, oh, well, you know, my friend, this, that, and the third would be great for this, we would love to have them out. One of the things that we do at this podcast, and I'll be public about this, is that we generally will bring the people out. We'll, we'll pay mm -hmm. for that uh, mm -hmm. if we think that they are uh, worthy of that and have the story worth telling. Right. So I would love everyone to visit beautiful Columbus, Ohio, Absolutely. and have a couple day vacation with us. We'll no get doubt. some, uh, you know, beautiful dinner, drinks, and uh, have the <laughs> bring podcast them over to the back. shop. That's right. We'll be That's out right. there. <laughs> so thank you all. Appreciate you, and we will catch you again.